Uh, welcome to Waves. In this session, we are going to go through and show you how to do a bunch of diff different demonstrations about how to do Waves, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 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 yeah and so there's going to be a variety of them. We're going to start with um, just Waves in general. Yeah. Yeah, when I start, when I teach this uh, and I go to, well, <laughs> pre-COVID went yeah. to <laughs> middle school anymore. classrooms, I would actually um, you start off simply with what is a wave? I would ask the class, what is a wave? And what kind of answers do we get? Oh, we get a lot of things about surfing, about water waves. Sometimes we get waving, princess waves, right? <laughs> so we all of these waves, don't we? Yeah. But eventually someone will throw out something about um, a microwave yeah, or... Right a light wave yeah, a sound wave someone's mm -hmm. heard it and they're going to mm -hmm. get to the point where they, they do give us something something to work off of and so i'm like all right so how do we define a wave is mm -hmm. the next thing that we go into because we want to define that in the simplest definition i've come up with um is simply a wave is a transfer of energy so we're transferring energy right. now that seems so abstract and so what we do, we will, uh, let's start with the black rope. Okay. We have a white background, black rope. This would be really, I think, a lot easier to see. Um, there, can you wrap up one more? Yep. There we go, because I'm running out of hand room here. So we can see, there we go. We can see in the middle one with that wave. We get this, we're gonna oscillate just to make it easier on us for now. Yeah, because in the middle, I can see the middle screen, it shows nicely the, uh, the, the wave. Yes, it's oscillating, but I'm okay with that for now. Um, because I just want to be able to see that node, that node's where it looks like it's not moving. Right. Right. And then we have our, our crests, mm -hmm. which is the two top spots, and then the trough. Yes. Right? Correct. So, all right, we're going to slow that down for a second. All right, and so Sarah, just keep your hand up about okay. here mm -hmm. and don't move, okay? Okay. Now, it, it's moving. Because I'm moving her hand because I'm shaking my hand and I'm actually running a wave down there to impart energy. And so now we will see if we can. I think this, there we go. Let's, there we go. Beautiful wave, beautiful wave. Now our wavelength is going to be crest to crest, right? Mm -hmm. And so. <laughs> You're vibrating, it's hilarious. So, if our, is something higher wavelength, or a higher energy, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. going to be a shorter wavelength or a longer wavelength? This is where I stop and ask the class, what do we think? If it's higher energy, and you'll get mixed answers on this. It's, always, it's, it's a great thing to have the kids go ahead and test out because they're going to come up and, and they'll have ideas right away. And then once they get going, they're like, oh, it, it really puts it or makes it concrete for them once they act physically get to experience what that looks like. Definitely. All right. So we will make the one wave, then put a lot more energy in there. But you can see it's taking a lot more of my energy. I'm running out. Whew. Just to increase or uh, to decrease that wavelength, uh, have a higher uh, frequency, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it, uh, higher energy, shorter wavelength. Takes a lot more energy. Now, um, I, let's ditch this for a second. Okay. And one of the things that uh, you don't have to use, have some fancy rope or something like that. I know years ago I had a, an orange extension cord that one end got all frayed, so we just cut off the ends of it, and we used that. It was orange. It was nice. It uh, worked really great. You could see it, and so I used that in the classroom. It worked fine. Uh, we have, let's go with the thick rope. Okay. We have a, a thicker rope. Uh, I realize it might not show up the best. Uh, you can still see it, I think, but you can see we can create that with mm -hmm. this nice rope. So, and that's what we like we put in the kits. And so if you actually got one of the kits, this is the rope we have in it. And you could do the shorter wavelengths if you have a lot oh, of energy, wow. which I don't. <laughs> My shoulder's getting numb here. Um, all right, let's dump that and go okay. to the next one. Go to the next one. All right, it, it, this is like... Um, clothesline? Yeah, clothesline stuff. And I'll tell you, you don't ever really buy a clothesline line for your clothesline anymore. This stuff breaks after a year. Um, experience. <laughs> But it works great too. I realize you're not going to be able to see this in the video very well, are you? I don't think they can see that in the middle. It blending in with white background. 
Sorry, I tried. All right, so <laughs> the wave is a transfer of energy, right? Let's head back to the middle. Okay. Um, a wave is a transfer of energy, and that's what we did there. We, we transferred energy from myself right. to you yep. over, and through a medium, and that medium was uh, whichever rope we had in our hands. Sure. And, so, and that is awesome. And that uh, is a really good visual. Mm -hmm. It helps kids start understanding the uh, amount of energy required. Then usually, I don't know, it's probably because I, I come from the geology world. And so I usually start off with the, um, like uh, talking about uh, earthquake waves. Because those are, once again, waves that we've kind of heard mm -hmm. of yep. from by now, is the earthquake waves. And so um, I will use those to talk about the S wave, because mm -hmm. we have two types of earthquake waves when we talk about those waves. We have your S wave and P wave. That's what we talk about at the middle school and even the high school level. We don't go into the Raleigh waves, love waves, stuff like that, usually in either of those. And so just S wave and P wave. Your P wave, your primary, your S wave, your secondary, right? Mm -hmm. And or shear wave. It would be secondary. Oftentimes we consider that a shear wave, okay. and that's what we just saw there. But your your P wave is a compression wave, and so and for years we've taught these with slinkies, and they work great using a slinky. Now, Science Supply Stores has these really nice. Um, this is a metal one. Metal, metal spring. coiled mm -hmm. spring. If you hunt coiled metal spring uh any science supply catalog uh you're gonna find these they're science teaching supply you're gonna find these these were great yep. now i like the plastic ones better i'm gonna be honest um it, I, just in my opinion i like plastic ones there they're slightly shorter which i'm all right with but i find they don't tie up as much and they don't get pulled stretched out i usually don't use the um uh, i don't use this one for mass waves we will right now because we're going to take care of it, especially since this is our last spring. All my plastic ones, I can't show you one of those. I've given all those away. Um, I can't order anything else now because we're in an ordering freeze. But um, the, it, the plastic ones are cheaper. And in my opinion, they're better. They don't coil quite as badly. You can get them undone if a kid does grab it and start messing with it. To me, it, it, those have just been a little bit better. The problem with these, we'll go ahead and stretch out um, to our spots. The problem with these that I've found is um, what will happen is you start using that for an S wave. Yes, it's a glorious, and it's a lot easier being uh, coiled. It's a lot easier to do that wave to make that go. I mean, that's a beautiful wave, I gotta admit it. And uh, those look nice too, and all of that. But what happens is kids will start pulling this too much and it'll be permanently stretched out. Once it's permanently stretched out, it, it, it just doesn't work as well. Now you're, you're, you're getting shorter and shorter and shorter, what you can do. But what does work nice, whoops, what does work nice, pull just a little bit more in. Yeah. Thank you. And what does work nice, we talk about a compression wave. You know, that primary wave is a compression wave where particles of the earth are being like squeezed together and go. And so we literally take part of this, compress it, let go. And we can see that traveling right down the, the line. We can see that traveling down the line. That's why the, the that's why we kind of use the slinky. That's why, and these work nicer than slinky simply because they're uh, it's a tighter coil, and so you can see it transfer a little bit better in my opinion. And um, they uh, you can go further. You can literally stretch the length of the classroom, which is I mean that's sweet. All right, let's drop that down okay. um, safely. Oh, um, now some of the things that what the teach some of the teachers they. Um, uh, I don't know. They're, maybe they're just not as reckless as I am. Just saying. Yeah. It's possible. It's possible. Um, but what they tell me is that they're really uncomfortable the swinging uh, things mm -hmm. up and things like that. And so what we will do then is we will lay them on the floor, mm -hmm. have the classroom all around. Or, I mean, in here we've even done it on the table. Right. And on the classroom around. And you just slide it back and forth rather than up and down. Mm -hmm. and you can get that. It, now, it doesn't work quite as well. Uh, it's, we got a video of it. I think we, we, I might try to cut part of that one video okay. in. Yeah, yeah. I can just kill the sound because it sounded terrible. Um, <laughs> it was bad. But it, one of the problems with it is it tends to, there's enough friction on the tables, right. even these slick tables here, yeah. there's enough friction. Um, it it kind of slowed it down, and so it didn't travel as well mm -hmm. all the way to the other end. And you sense. definitely didn't get reflection. Mm -hmm. When we did this, oftentimes you got reflection where it was bouncing back mm -hmm. to the other person. You don't get that. But it still works. So if you're 
a little more careful or safe or cautious cautious a little more cautious than i am then uh, maybe that's the way you want to go with that and uh, just do it on the floor have all the kids standing around and that way it's they can see the wave they can see it travel but like i said friction overcoming that friction of, the, of whatever surface it's going on is really kind of going to slow it down and so do expect that do expect that all right, for the introduction, anything else for the introduction? I think we're ready to go right. to electromagnetic. Is that where we're headed? Uh, no. No? We have one thing before we get to electromagnetic. Oh, mechanical. Yeah, okay. we got to talk about those mechanical, mechanical ways. ways. Uh, now, in the video, what well, we're going to include uh, in the... Um, lesson plan yes a link to a couple like powerpoints that we're putting together um they're just modified ones from ones i've used when i've taught this in middle schools and uh, to, to explain the difference between mechanical wave and electromagnetic um yeah they're okay uh it, it's not the greatest thing ever put together i just put it together because it worked for me i taught it uh to be honest more of it was part of the lecture talk that they got more out of it i think but since we had so many things in waves mm -hmm. we're trying to keep this under 25 hours um okay no i'm not kidding we're trying to keep <laughs> really? it down um so, um so we know this one's a little bit long with all the waves so it we're, i'm just gonna make those powerpoints and so insert oh i looked at the mechanical versus electrical wave powerpoint now perfect now we're going to go to mechanical waves and do some examples of that Thank you. Thank you. Before we get into the electromagnetic waves, okay. uh, we have mechanical waves. Yes. And so, and that has to travel through a medium, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not going to travel through a vacuum. And so some examples of waves, and we have some things here that uh, I want to make sure we talk about, is uh, my favorite is this. When I talk to the kids, is in, I realize you might not have one of these, I'm sorry. Um, but this is fossilized ripple marks. I forgot where the camera was. This is fossilized ripple marks. And so as the water waves, and so this is once again evidence of um, prehistoric wow. uh, water. Yeah. And so as water waves go over the top of, of the, uh, like a, a, a river mm -hmm. or stream, what happens is the sediment below will also start uh, forming ripple marks. Oh. If you ever have a stream that's kind of settled down, you mm -hmm. can kind of see that sometimes. And so this, that's what's happened here. And we have what's really cool, I'll turn it sideways, hopefully we'll be able to see it all right. But you can see where the uh, crest in the trough yeah. is, right? Yeah. You can see where those are here. You can see which direction the wave was going. Because then we could pull up Google Earth if we wanted to and look at sand dunes mm -hmm. and talk about the waves. You know how that's going through on how they come up, then they break. And so just like an ocean wave, mm -hmm. a water wave, a sediment wave is going to work the same. It's just like as the sand dunes. And so, and that's evidence of obviously flowing. In this case, the energy, it, it was water, mm -hmm. and it was just depositing this. And so it's, I love that. I, love, I like showing that to the kids. If you ever have come across something like that, always save that out. And uh, I'll do, uh, oh, in our outdoor rock display, sorry. Um, well, let me ask you, where, where did you get that? Uh, that came, actually our grad students picked it up on a field trip. Okay. Um, out west. But there is, we have on on our outreach page mm -hmm. for EAPS, we have a, the outdoor rock display. Oh. We yeah. have that on there, and um, we have updated descriptions. And so that's something they could go on and see our 360. The Perfect. Sarah and I made a 360. Yeah. Um, Google tour. Yeah, Google tour. Mm -hmm. And so it, we'll put a link to that in the description here. But Wait, I'm, can I ask you, how old is it? I don't remember. You don't remember? No. But it's fossilized. We'd have to ask, like, Chris Andronicus. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Professor Andronicus. We'd have to ask him. I do okay. not remember. I'm sure that they told me when they gave it to me, but I don't remember, unfortunately. Okay. All right. But, all right. Now, have you ever been in a car? Well, I, yes. I know you've been in a car. Yes. Um, have you ever been in a car and all of a sudden it's like the dashboard kind of starts shaking yeah. once you hit a certain... Yeah. Uh, my wife's car... My car doesn't seem to do that, but I think it's because I'm such a slow and uh, careful driver. Um, yeah, but uh, her van does uh, at about 60 mile an hour is about every time the dashboard starts shaking. Hmm. You're just hitting at that speed. You're kind of hitting that frequency with the tires and the road where things vibrate and shake. Right. Right. Well, buildings, and uh, if it, any of our teachers are in earthquake places, they definitely know this. Um, Indiana, we don't uh, really know that too much since 
we don't have a lot of activity. Um, I only remember a couple of earthquakes in my life. And, uh, but we have, uh, buildings will have a natural frequency which um, they'll resonate, a okay. resonant frequency, mm -hmm. right? And so we, this is a, the BOSS model. And so this is actually one that was just in a lab when I got here. Uh, someone's put this together years ago. And I know they're available commercially, or if you just get a two by four, a couple of one by fours, and some, uh, this is a, a all thread from the hardware store. Get the really thin all thread dough. Uh, so it, I bought like quarter inch once, and this must, must be closer to eighth. And um, it, was, it was stiff. It was a workout to get it to work. Okay. And so go with the thinnest stuff you can find. Okay. Uh, I was in a hurry and didn't want to look any longer, and mm -hmm. I definitely made it more of a workout. And uh, I apologize to teachers that I gave those away to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hope Christopher's not watching this. I think he got three of them. Uh, so, all right, so I'm going to go with a nice short wavelength. What are you there? I see you're moving it, but short, really short, back yep. and forth. Short, back and forth. Think of a short wavelength. Yep. Shorter wavelength. The shorter building, shorter right? Building, okay. Let's increase our wavelength a little. Bop your head there. Oh, I'm dodging. I've done this before. <laughs> as in hit my head. Oh. <laughs> um, all right. So, longer wavelength. Oh, wow. You're really isolating those different ones. That's cool. Well, because that's their resident frequency. Mm. And let's do those slow, long wavelengths. Wow. I really like this. Uh, it, it, it's easy to put together and make one of these yourself. And um, I, a couple of tips though. If you do, um, whether you make one or if you buy one, whichever, um, it, it has a little wing nuts to hold it on and adjust it. And there's always, they're all the way through, drilled mm -hmm. through, right? And so as it starts getting a little loose and uh, as you keep tightening it up and always check the bottom because what will happen is the, and that's why we have a scratch right here. Oh, oops. Uh, what will happen, sometimes the uh, all thread will come down a little too far and you've tightened it, but you didn't check the bottom, so it sticks out the bottom of the wood. Okay. So instead of this nice smooth piece of wood mm -hmm. to glide it on, you have one piece of metal there that it's, it, it'll just scratch the heck out of your tables uh, quite, quite badly. And so uh, always, always give out a double check. Uh, I don't use it enough to remember to double check, and so, you know. My bad. All right, so when we talk about resonance frequencies, right? I love using, because I'm an annoying person, The uh, these are just the metal bars. You can buy them at science stores for, uh, as residence bars, residence rods, or go to your hardware store and get a... Um, what is this? About a half inch, three quarter inch uh, aluminum dowel. Um, but a little bit more rosin. So you're using violin rosin? Yes. No, I'm using viola rosin. Viola rosin? No, it's a cello rosin. I think it's all three. Oh, any stringed instrument. There it is. As we're imparting energy into it, we are, um, let's stop that. We are, here's the node. My finger okay. is going to hold the node and so, and our wavelengths, mm -hmm. right? And so think of that wave going. Okay. And so this, um, is longer. Now let's go with the shorter one. We talked about shorter the wavelength, the what? Well, you got to answer. They can't answer. Okay. They've already so answered. Sh shorter the wavelength, and we're thinking um, higher energy. And sh um, let's see. Shorter wavelength is higher energy. And, and higher that's what our kids will do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll lock up and say, yeah. Shorter yeah. wavelength is higher energy and also a higher frequency. Yeah, I'll ask, so what's that mean with pitch? Right. And uh, it, it seems like the ones in, in choir, orchestra, and band, they'll have a better idea. Mm -hmm. Definitely a lot uh, more annoying. And uh, actually what I'll usually do is, is, is pick one of my squirrely kids and I kind of put it out on their head. <laughs> and uh, just to be honest. 
But one of, the, uh, one of the stories, can I tell a quick story? Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this might be a little long, I'm sorry. One of the quick stories. Uh, I was doing demo shows. Okay. Um, when I was working, oh, the rosin is just regular, like rosin, mm -hmm. you bought it. You, you can buy it already crushed up at Science Supply Store. I was going to say, we did just bought some rosin and it came in a really nice, you know, dust free. And I think we had to break it up quite a bit to be able to get it. Yeah, I, I bought this and I'm almost out. Uh, what I did before, I put this uh, in a baggie and I, I, I hammered the heck out of it. And so. Makes sense. Yeah. It worked for me. Mm -hmm. You can buy it already powdered. Anyway, all right, where I was going with this. Yes. Uh, I love telling the story because the kids always get a really good kick out of it, and uh, it's true. Um, it's scared to, scared the daylights out of me. I have no daylights in me at all now. <laughs> and so I, I was doing um, demo shows for okay. big groups, and there was three or 400 people at a fairgrounds. Okay. Big old metal 4-H building. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been in those, right? Mm -hmm. Those big metal buildings. And uh, I'm up on stage, and I did my. Uh, it was I was doing climate and weather okay. demonstrations for air pressure and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you and I have done a lot of those right. demos since then. And I got these, but I was so excited, I wanted to try them and see how people would react because I was getting ready to do my catch a wave demo show. Oh. Um, not that day, but that's I was making it. Okay. I was you know making that. And so I, I got these, and I said, "All right, this is really cool game. I just want to show you this." And there was a lot of energy in the room, and it was everybody was excited. I might just done all these other demos, and and so I grabbed the middle rod, and I, I started going across. Mm -hmm. It started giving me that that slow, you know, where it starts it feels like it's a little not as loud, but then you keep putting more energy mm -hmm. in it, and it vibrates more and more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's the vibration of this rod that's making that noise, mm -hmm. which is so cool. Well, all of a sudden, you realize the sound is like hitting you. It's like when uh, at a parade, when the boom, when the yeah, band comes through the parade, it's boom. It felt like that. Huh. It was hitting you. I matched the natural frequency of the metal trusses in the building, and they were vibrating. Nice. No, scary. <laughs> All I could see was Purdue Steve kills 400 people oh, in word. science demo. That's all I could see flashing <laughs> through my head. But as soon as I stopped it, everything stopped. Wow. And so, uh, yeah, that was that was really scary. Uh, I, I don't know if it would have ever vibrated enough right. um, to do something, and I will never find out. Um, but you want a, a scary time. If you're in a metal building, be careful what frequency careful. you're using. Matching those frequencies. <laughs> so those are some fun mechanical ones, um, it, waves, demonstrations that I like to do with mm -hmm. the kids, just just to get them uh, excited about it. I mean, these are, you know, high energy, but pun intended. Yeah. Get it? Get yeah. it. I got it. Yeah, okay. it's funny. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, these are fun demonstrations just to kind of drive the point home. Yeah. And I, I like the resonance rods because it, it's that's once again another visual. Mm -hmm. With me, I'm all about those visuals. I am not an audible learner. I really don't. <laughs> you don't believe me, ask my wife. <laughs> um, I don't. So we're going to do Stephen's favorite demonstration for sound waves today. We're going to make a vuvuzela. I think I say that. I've also heard vuvuzela. And um, what you need for this is a straw. Patience. <laughs> this is also, I'll just say this, um, this is good to do if you are, if you can do it at the very end of the day, if you see your students all day, or if you, if your students change classes, you want to do it towards the end of the class period. Right before they go to art. Mm -hmm. Right before they leave your classroom. I don't care where they go once they're done with me. I don't care. But you also, if you love your students, might want to tell them that they need to be careful with these or they will get in trouble. So it's just, you'll see. This right is before a, a music class would be best. Oh, yeah. The music teacher would really appreciate it, I'm sure. So you're going to get your straw. All right, I have a and straw. And the first thing you want to do is um, clip off the, if it's a bendy straw, you want to clip the bendy straw off. All right. So we just have. Does that be straight? Have, yeah, just have straight. And then what is we want to do enough? is. Oh, that's fine. And so then we want to choose one end, and you want to pinch one end down. So you kind of flatten one end. Ooh, that's straight. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just flatten one end. Flatten it. Yep, flatten it. Okay. So then you're going to take your scissors, and you want to make two diagonal cuts. So you kind of make like a like a pointy edge. So you're like cutting the ears off the flat. Sure. So is that what I'm doing? Do that. Now, I've been in classrooms where we've taught this, and I say we as in Sarah, while I stood in the back crying. 
<laughs> and How then, big of a diagonal? I kind of, I make it. I oh, you're know. making it like a sharp point. Like a sharp point, right. Can you, are you allowed to have sharp objects? Maybe we shouldn't do this. I don't think I'm allowed to The kids objects. love it way too much to not do it. So we're pinching the end. So the idea is you want it to be flat. So we're going to put this in our mouth and we're going to blow and we're going to get a sound wave to come out of this. Um, it's a really lovely sound. You're going to love this. And the thing is, is that this is good. You're going to get the sound from the vibration of these two. So, <laughs> so when you put this in, it takes a little bit of practice. The kids pick it up immediately. And the more squirrely the students are, the quicker they figure it out. Just so you know, it's, it's a correlation. You're going to put this in and um, you, you almost sort of blow down. If you ever played an instrument, you might get this a little quicker. It takes a little bit of practice, but every student has always been able to do this every time we've done it. <laughs> see, see what a fun sound this is. So we're getting this when we blow the air and we're getting the vibration from... Um, it vibrated my lips. Yeah, <laughs> you'll feel that. So we get a sound. Now so the challenge is how can we change this sound? How, how, what can we do to change the sound? <laughs> Your sound still sounds the same. So how it can does? we change it? What do you mean by the sound? Well, I mean the, the frequency of the sound wave. Oh. Right. So we're getting a frequency, one frequency. We don't have any holes, so we can't play it like an instrument or anything. Well, can we put a hole in it? You could put a hole in it, but then it's not. you're not going to get your sound anymore. Really? Yeah. Are you sure? Oh, you did get a sound. Okay, so you're actually making an instrument. You're, this is the advanced, or I guess we're just jumping right to the advanced Bavuzela lesson. Uh, well, you told what me I, I couldn't, thinking, so I did. <laughs> what I was thinking it's is we're going to... Same tone, though, isn't it? Same tone. We're going to change um, by shortening the tube. Higher pitch. Okay. It gets a little higher. Come out. Send them down the hall. There we go. This is for when you have, you know, that teacher you really love right beside you. Oh, this is really bad for COVID. I just spit all over the table. We're not socially distanced either. <laughs> so. Do this inside your masks. Okay. <laughs> so it's a great way to, first of all, it's <laughs> showing that it's vibrations moving through air that's creating the sound wave. So that's one thing. They, they can feel the vibration on their lips, so they know that that's there. They can experiment with the different frequencies by shortening the length of the vivuzula. And um, some of the kids at the very end, they'll tell you that they've thrown everything away and all they'll do is keep the very um, pointed part with just the tiniest little bit of the tube left and they can hide that real good under their tongue and they'll just carry it around with them the rest of the day and make really annoying high-pitched squeaks all day long and it's gonna annoy all the teachers, but they learned it in science. All right, so it's we have a lot of um, apps these days, right? And so with the apps, what we do, um, love doing, uh, is, and I've seen this more and more, it's, it's been very popular in the last few years, mm -hmm. is when we start talking about earthquakes, mm -hmm. and of course a lot of teachers have them do the triangulation, and we'll talk about how far it is and the distance. We mm -hmm. talked a little bit about that in the intro. But we will uh, download a seismometer app. You can get them on iPads, you can get them on the phones, 
uh, I know we used to use probes mm -hmm. with a accelerometer, single axis accelerometer is yeah. what we used to use. And uh, we did different, like an earthquake engineering activity. Okay. And, so, and we can link to that in the description. Okay. In the, in, the lessons, in the lesson plan that you get, we'll make sure the link's there. Yeah. As long as Sarah remembers. Uh, so we did these, and I actually I see in the back of my lab now one of the things that we used to do for public events, which is a, a wooden box with bricks in it and a seismometer. And we would put that in there, and we would like drop a bowling ball out in the ground and then go further away and drop the bowling ball again to see how that dissipates, that oh, energy dissipates. Right. But you can use the seismometer apps and do that in the classroom. Okay. And so you can actually uh, put a seismometer app on, have it recording, and you can use an accelerometer if you want, and use the actual accelerometer. I mean, your phones have a built-in accelerometer. They do. And so you don't have to buy a, a probe from one of the probe companies to do that. All phones have, well, phones not do. all phones. All phones have built in a series of built-in sensors, which yeah. I didn't. We have both just recently learned this when we went to. But uh, some of the like track phones didn't have this something. They in don't it. have the gyroscope. I think the, for the the gyroscope, they yeah. have the accelerometer. And the gyro That's right. what it is. Thank you. So, in, so where you need a gyroscope is for the um, the three D stuff. Yeah, three D VR. 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 Yeah, but. You can um, access, you know, a seismometer like Stephen is saying, mm -hmm. or um, Google Science Journal is also a free app that you can download, and that will run through a complete list mm -hmm. of all the sensors that your phone does have. So my phone is better than Stephen's because I have a gas pressure sensor on mine. So I only know that because of the Google Science Journal, and I just like to rub it in because it's my one thing that I have that he doesn't. So. Uh huh. So, uh huh. But in that, there are um, X, Y, and Z accelerometers, yes. I believe. And so you can move your phone in different ways and it will graph it for you. It's pretty cool to look at. Oh, heck, what I did with even my elementary kids, so I know, mm -hmm. I know our, our uh, middle school kids can do them, is we used a tray. Oh, okay. And we would shake the tray, mm -hmm. you know, it short and fast to see that small, yeah. and then the longer to be able to see the longer waves. Yeah. So we would simulate them that way. Okay. And uh, it, that's just a good way for them to be able to visualize and see things. Mm -hmm. One of the activities that we have now, the earthquake engineering, mm -hmm. is we actually use a, uh, actually when I first did that, I used just a tray and I taped off. If we shake it from here to here versus shaking the tray from here to here, and we have them build structures with uh, cardstock. Mm -hmm. They get like a eight by 10 piece of cardstock and it was already cut into strips and one meter of tape and they had to build something that would support a golf ball. Okay. And so we had to put the, without the golf ball, AK okay, people falling out of the yeah. top of their thing. And, and so uh, we would shake it based on that. Well, then uh, so technology showed up and we had accelerometers. Yeah. And so I would, I would buy a probe accelerometer on the computer and project that up with the TV or to the TV. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, I'm dating myself, TV. Um, so now you have projectors. Um, not a word, nerd. Not a word. Uh, <laughs> You kids and your fancy technology. Oh. <laughs> um, but we would um, project that up so everybody in the class can see the shaking yeah. with the accelerometers, which is really cool. Nice. But we can still do that if you have like a classroom iPad that you can air Apple Play or use, um, like you said, the Google, Google Science Journal. Science mm -hmm. Journal. And so then they can watch that. It, that's a really fun little earthquake engineering type of thing mm -hmm. to build a. a, a um, engineering resistant building sure. or earthquake resistant building mm -hmm. engineering, engineering resistant, resistant. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in a few houses that were engineering resistant so <laughs> <laughs> all right so that's uh, the end of our mechanical waves we'll jump in next with the electromagnetic, electromagnetic. Yeah, yeah Sarah does the introduction here for the electromagnetic okay we'll see you in a second we just talked about two different kinds of waves. We have mechanical waves and electromagnetic waves. And we're gonna look a little bit at electromagnetic waves right now. And so electromagnetic waves have various wavelengths. And then of course with those wavelengths are different frequencies. And I love to start with visible light with my students when we're talking about electromagnetic waves. And so when you think about visible light, um, we know that visible light can be passed through a prism and it can, it can form a rainbow. And so white light forms a continuous spectrum, which means that we have all the colors of the rainbow. So I usually begin by asking, well, what are the colors of the rainbow in order? 
And so then the students will give me, you know, different colors. And so then I'll say, well, it, are they always going to be in that order? Is it always that same order? And so we know typically it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, or Roy G. Biv. If you use the first letter of each of those colors, it makes that acronym. And so then I'll ask students, well, could we ever mix up the colors? Well, is there ever a time where we'll see white light uh, in, in a different order than the Roy G. Biv order? And so then they'll think about it. A lot of students will claim that they have seen rainbows in, with a different order. Um, and so then we say, okay, well, let's test this. And so what I like to do is I like to get a pair of prism glasses and have each student get a, a pair. And then they will put these on. And we're actually going to put a, a pair of glasses on over the camera so that you'll be able to um, do this little demonstration with us. We'll go ahead and we'll put the prism glasses on. And then I just take a lamp, and we have this just a, a clip-on lamp right now, just an incandescent bulb. And so I'll clip it on the light, or on the side of the table here, and I'll turn on the light. And this is a really fun, it's a real wow moment for the students when you turn on the lamp, right? So then if you look at the lamp, um, we should see this continuous spectrum. We should see the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. We see all of those colors. And we actually see multiple colors because of the diffraction grading in the glasses um, kind of around the main light source. So then I'll ask students, okay, well, what order are the colors that you see? And so they'll take a minute and they'll look. And I'll say, okay, well, now test and see. Can you move your head? Can you move your body? Can you move in a way that you can try to make the red change places with the purple? And so then they'll try different ways of, of moving their head and moving around. But it ultimately will come down to, um, well, no, there's really nothing we can do to change this order. So if you notice, the red is always going to be on the far outside. And then the violet is always going to be closest to the light source. And then with the other colors in between, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So I'm going to go ahead and, and shut the lamp off. So we talk about the, um, the order of this color actually goes with the, the wavelength. And so we see that the red, when we, when we look at those colors, the red is the longest on the outside of that rainbow, and it's always on the outside. It's always the farthest away because red corresponds with the longest wave of visible light. And then orange is the next longest, and then yellow is the next longest. Violet has the shortest wave of all those, and you notice that violet is always the color closest to the light source. So it doesn't have as far to travel. It's a shorter wavelength. And so it... Um, you're always going to have that order no matter what. So I say, okay, well, that was a light bulb. Well, let's test it out with something different. Let's try um, what are some other sources of visible light? What are some other sources of white light? So an incandescent bulb is one source of white light. Another source of white light would be the sun. And so we might check out a window and, um, and do the same thing. You know, do you see all the colors? Are there any colors missing? Um, you know, can you move your head? Can you make the colors change the order? And then um, another source of light it would be a flame. And so then we'll do the same thing. We'll put on the pair of glasses, and so we'll put those back on. And the students always, this is always the, a favorite. And so I'll say, okay, well watch real close when I ignite the match and then light the candle and then tell me what you see. And so now the rainbow is a little smaller because the source of light's a little smaller, right? We have the flames just a little smaller, but you'll still see that the red is the farthest out, the violet is always the closest to the flame, and there's no way that I can move my head to change that order. And so it's really showing us that red is associated with the longest wavelength because it's always the farthest away from the source of the light. Violet is always the shortest wavelength of visible light, um, and it's always the closest to that light source. Sir, it we're talking about waves, and you broke out the, what is this, vegetable oil? Vegetable oil. It, it, what is going on? Okay, well, tell me what you see. I see a clear glass rod. Correct. And why are you seeing a clear glass? And I like that you said clear, so that's a good observation okay. there. So, okay. Oh, I'm a good observer. <laughs> so why do you think you're seeing this glass rod? Um, well, I know I see things because light reflects off of it to my eye. That's correct. So okay. light is traveling and it's hitting this glass string rod at an angle, and some of that light is being reflected. But the rest of that light, it continues and it's refracting or bending around the glass stirring rod. 
So as light travels from the air to the glass, um, it's it slows a little. So. So as it, so you're saying to the glass. So you're saying as it goes, since this is clear, mm -hmm. it's going through it. Mm -hmm. And as it goes through it, it decreases in speed. It decreases in speed. A, 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 uh, here, hold on. Here's a piece of paper. Okay. A, a difference in that, it's not going through this. Correct. This yes. is just straight up reflection, it's right? reflecting. Mm -hmm. All right, so explain to me why I see I'm not red and blue colorblind. So it's, uh, <laughs> I can't that explain helps. that. <laughs> you can't explain why I'm not? No. So, but explain to me why do, does this look blue to me? Mm -hmm. Why does this look red? I mean, I can keep going. I have different pieces All of paper over here. And so why do I see mm -hmm. these different colors? Well, you're seeing the light that's being transmitted or reflected. But it's okay. absorbing all of the other colors. So the only color in this, I think it's in the pigment of the paper that it's in, that it's not absorbing, it, that it's transmitting, those are the colors that you see. Okay. So if I see something that is like uh, green, mm -hmm. then what I'm seeing actually is all the lights hitting it, mm -hmm. it absorbs wavelengths of light. Correct. And it's reflecting yes. back the wavelengths that are in the green part of the spectrum. The visible light. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's and right. so, and we know that it's like if we shine light through a prism, it separates it out, mm -hmm. right? Yes, that's a diffraction grating, and it'll separate out it, all And the we use with the prism glasses. Yes. We saw that. Mm -hmm. And so, we know this is reflecting those wavelengths of red. Yes. Oh. So, so with this some being of it's clear, going through that. Mm -hmm, with this being clear, that's a type of material then that um, that, that light, it, it can pass through. Yes. And so it, it slows down as it's going from the air to the glass because all of the materials have a different index of refraction. And so there's um, the, the higher the index of refraction, the slower the light moves through that material. Okay. So I'm going to show you how we can make one, a glass stirring rod um, invisible. 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 Mm -hmm. No way. So the closer that the that you can match an index of refraction, um, the less reflection of light happens, and okay. also um, the refraction is is not transmitting as much light either. So the light doesn't have to slow down any. And so if light's not slowing down as it passes from one medium to another, um, then it's just going to be that continu it's continuously going and mm -hmm. it's going to look invisible. That's what we're, it kind of plays a trick uh, on our eyes. Is that what so the oil's for That's then? what the oil's for. Okay. So oil has a very similar index of refraction to a glass stirring rod. And so we've placed some oil in a, in a beaker. I'm going to turn it just so the writing's not right there. And as I put this in, and we can hopefully zero in a little bit on this, but as I put this in, now you can see, so we can well, see the see light it. reflecting on the boundary just a little bit, okay. but um, it's just a very like a, like a ghost of a shape. Oh, there. when I move, I can mm -hmm. see. Just when I move, just right, I can see. It. Right, Otherwise, can I can't see it. see it at all. Yeah. So because the index again, the index of refraction of the glass stirring rod is very closely matched to the vegetable oil that we're using, <laughs> so it's causing um, not as much light being reflected at the boundary of that glass stirring rod shape, and not as much light is being refracted um, as it's transmitting that as well. Uh, you can do this with a lot of different materials. You can really set up a really cool investigation if you try some different, um, like water, let's say. So we have a, a beaker of water here. We can try this and, oh, keep that there. If we slide that in. It's, uh, my lab's not the cleanest of waters. <laughs> And so here we can, well, I can see that quite, we can see that pretty well quite. because that index of refraction of the water is probably a little smaller than what the index of refraction of the glass stirring rod is. So light's moving a little quicker through the water yeah. and then it slows down as it That's hits that glass right. stirring rod. Okay. Um, this also we're seeing an air pocket in the center. Um, so this is probably when it was made, it was probably it almost reminds me of like a burette or something. It has that that yeah. layer of air in, on the inside. Well, we pulled random things out of my lab. Yeah. Who knows what it so, was? Yeah. But, um, but again, so Caro corn syrup uh, is another one. Corn syrup in general is going to have a higher index of refraction. So um, you could you could investigate if we had some of that. You could you could try putting a glass string rod into that. Um, uh, why, why do we have these? We have these are these are a little different. These are uh, uh, more hollow on the inside and it's They're a wider diameter. They're eye droppers. And so if we first just put this in. We can definitely see that eyedropper. Yeah, but then you if did I, not go invisible on If I squeeze it and let some of that vegetable oil go in, 
Oh. Now we can still see the boundary around it. So there's mm. still a little bit of light reflecting. It's still refracting and transmitting that light a little bit, but, um, but it's the better. The, yeah, the inside is not. But then if I... It definitely makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have that air anymore. So again, it would speed up again as it got to the air. So it's um, like cloaking, but not good cloaking technology. That's right. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a medial. Like an early yeah. cling on cloaking. Sure. Yeah. Just like that. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can show um, a glass test tube. This is just something else you might, if you don't have a glass stirring rod or if you just want to try other materials. Mm -hmm. Are you going to go with the top part? Or? Now, the glass stirring rod itself is going to float in the oil, so that's why we have the test tube holder. Right. And Stephen's going to fill this up with some oil. And we're going to see as you fill it up, and there's a few air bubbles, so we see some of those. But again, kind of like with the eyedropper, it it mostly turns invisible. Yeah, I, yeah, I had air bubbles in the. Yeah. I had must have poured that in too fast. But yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So again, just this is kind of fun. It's really something that students need to experience. They need to see that. It doesn't work as well for a demonstration because they need to get up close and really um, take a look at this happening. But, um, you know, you can I, think have... it, I agree. It definitely works better up close. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I don't think your whole class, just because that's out there, I don't think the whole class would be able to quite see that as well, mm -hmm. maybe from a distance. But, yeah, I, I, I could definitely see that being better if they we had enough supplies for sure. all yeah so yeah so try setting up some different materials and and see what works best you know what 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 material might have an index of refraction that most closely matches the glass stirring rod mm, beautiful mm -hmm. it's nice thank you yeah all right we just talked about the visible light section of the electromagnetic spectrum and we talked about its roy g bit red orange yellow blue indigo violet Towards the violet end, you're going to transition into the next section of the electromagnetic it, spectrum. Is that higher energy or lower? So remember that the red, when we looked at our sources of light and the flame at the at the light that was clamped onto mm -hmm. the side of the table, if you looked out the window, we looked at our rainbow, and we saw red was always on the very outside. And, you, and the way I would tell my students is you think about it, you would have to travel farther to go from the source of light to get to the red. And it's always that way. We can never make the red closest to the source of light. And therefore, red has the longer wavelength. Violet is always closest to the source of light. It doesn't have to travel as far. It's a shorter wavelength. And so, um, so we always know that violet is associated with a shorter wavelength. So now we're getting into an even shorter wavelength. Right, yes. ultraviolet. And one Alt thing UV I, is ultraviolet. Yes, ultraviolet. And that's the shorter wavelength, which tells us it's more energy. Yes. So right? remember back so from our intro when we were um, demonstrating the different waves. It didn't take much energy to make a nice, long, slower wave. It took a lot of energy. We couldn't do it as long to make those shorter waves. Yes. And that's where our UV beads come in, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was, I mean, we, we play with these. Uh, my wife's a kindergarten. I mean, I, I've seen her use them in her classes even yeah. Yeah. all the way through college. Yes. And so uh, with the college kids, is, I would say I told my elementary kids when I thought the, about the, my rock hammer, having some of these in my rock hammer. And why did you put them on your rock hammer? Well, because UV light is higher energy, and that's what gives us sunburns. Okay. That's what burns us mm -hmm. and obviously causes you know cancers and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And so with that higher energy rays, we put on sunblock to block those rays. Okay. And so we have the UV beads, which you can get, you know, any science supply store. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, what's really cool about these is, as we were talking earlier, mm -hmm. um, I think you do it kind of after the lesson. You'll have the kids uh, sometimes make uh, bracelets. Mm -hmm. Yep, we'll make bracelets and they'll, they'll send them home and I'll say, okay, make some observations when you go home. Because when they're in the classroom still, they're mostly white on, the, on their wrist. And then as they walk home or go outside for the evening, they'll notice some changes. Now, me with a slightly younger grade, I would give them, uh, we would put in, it, as I mentioned before, I don't have a science budget that uh, the big the big kids have. And so um, each kid would get like three. And uh, yeah. we'd put that on a string, put that on. 
and their job was to journal about it before we taught anything about light before we, and so we did it as an investigation and inquiry mm -hmm. and so we're going to figure this out what what are these beads what happens to them i wouldn't tell them something would happen and so we i'd be just like journal everything you can about the beads and then all of a sudden they're so excited they're coming back hey you know yeah. my dear color what colors are yours you know and so we eventually get to the point where we talk about you know the energy so the mm -hmm. wavelengths and mm -hmm. the spectrum and the fact that these have a uh, coating on them that causes them to luminesce mm -hmm. in the, uh, the the presence of certain wavelengths mm -hmm. and what's really neat about that is i also have a rock collection um being a bit of a geology person and so it, i have some natural fluorescing uh, materials in some of the rocks Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. wow. uh, you think this is totally unnatural because we have these fake plastic beads, but it, that's we get that in nature, <laughs> which is really cool. And so we have um, old Mr. Smith's uh, black light from the party days back in the 70s, baby. Yeah. <laughs> this literally is the one from my room when I was a little kid. Um, I had black light posters. I was the coolest kid around. But I had no friends to show it to, so, you know. But so what we'll do, what's really cool about the black light mm -hmm. is it fluoresces in the UV range. And um, this is take two because in take one, I kept saying IR. And I'll explain to you why I kept saying that in a minute. <laughs> but look how fast wow. that works. It works really fast. And so we can actually show these. I mean, don't, uh, so you don't have to worry if you're not, oh, I can't take my kids outside. No, I can't give them those. I've had this bag here that I've been using for outreach for, mm -hmm. I don't know, 15 years probably. <laughs> 10, 15 years, this same bag. Now, granted, it started off full. And so oh, okay. I've given some to teachers over the time and stuff like yeah. that. And, and kids sometimes when I do things. But uh, I just use it and it's still in the plastic bag. And, uh, they'll turn back to white here shortly and I'll reuse it again and so what's nice about that is if you're doing it just as a demonstration mm -hmm. it's it's really good you can really use that and so that's an expenditure you don't have to worry about every year something I noticed when you were holding these up you weren't actually touching the black light to the no. beads and I think that's another really neat observation for students to make that that ultraviolet light doesn't have to be touching your skin to cause problems I just get it close enough that it, it, it it, a lot of it hits it because mm -hmm. you know it, um, it, you'll have decay with distance. Yeah. Uh, and so it, I mean, you can see we were we never were I don't think closer than a couple inches there, and you can see how much mm -hmm. how bright that is. And so that was a lot of exposure. Right. And so it's uh, kind of a safety thing also. Now it's we have like a fancy commercial one that that we got, and this is actually one that came from the geology department here. Oh, okay. And so, yeah, they yeah. were cleaning up stuff They're like, oh, our professor, uh, that professor left. Do you want this one? <laughs> of course I do. Um, we scrounge everything. And so it, it works, but I still use my regular black light because kids have seen them. That's yeah. part of their world. Yep. And so and that's the idea. Now, the reason I kept saying... Um, infrared. I almost said UV this time. I keep flipping them backwards. <laughs> but the reason I was saying infrared is uh, not because I'm taking a call but because I want to show another demonstration. Okay. Um, with infrared, mm -hmm. infrared is the other side, right? Mm -hmm. It's close to the red. Now, one of my favorite things to do is to tell the kids uh, to get their phones out, mm -hmm. which in some, in some of the schools, uh, that's a big deal. It is. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's a really big deal. <laughs> and so, it, but it's, it's really fun to have them tell them that they get your phones out. And then I will grab a, a remote control. And with the remote control, you, I didn't check it before. Oh, uh, I didn't make sure I have batteries. Oh, here we go. Oh, glad that's why I grabbed two of them. I yep. didn't check to see if the batteries <laughs> work before we started recording. Now, so I want to press a button here, and you don't see anything there. And I'll shine this around and mm -hmm. show all the kids you don't see anything, and so it didn't do anything, right? Well, it is now. My cell phone, you can see. And you see it, how it's actually flashing super fast. Mm -hmm. And so it's that beam, uh, that IR beam, the infrared beam that, oops, thank you, yeah. uh, that is making, uh, telling the instrument and it's reading that flash. Oh, wow. And so think of uh, Morse code with infrared light uh, for your, um, it's not actually using Morse code, it's a different thing. But anyway, um, but for your uh, 
uh, device mm -hmm. that it's controlling. And so that's a fun thing. Um, I like going around. It's They're always recording it. It's hilarious. Um, although I think some of them are just recording me being goofy. <laughs> but now here's the thing. Oh, wrong thing. Um, cell phones. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, your cell phone works with this. My cell phone works with and this. And so does yes. mine. We both have Android phones. Yes. Uh, hers is fancier than mine. She reminds me all the time. Yes. Um, I have a gas pressure sensor in yeah. mine, which is amazing. So. We'll talk about that later with yeah. climate okay. stuff, okay? <laughs> okay? Yes. I don't have a gas pressure sensor. Um, but <laughs> but uh, uh, Apple phones, it won't work with Apple phone because there is, what is there is, there's a clear film on mm -hmm. there which absorbs that light. Yes. And so it, if I grab my DSLR, it will have a, a clear film on it. It won't show up with that. But if I grab uh, like uh, our old point and shoot, mm -hmm. it works. Okay. And so, and that's why I tell all the kids to get their phones out because we're going to find someone that has one. Right. And then, of course, I have mine in my pocket just to make sure. Because uh, <laughs> either I've been to classes like, oh, we don't have a cell phone, or like there's two cell phones and they're both Apple. I'm like, that's my luck. I think and, that's a neat thing to bring up, too, that, you know, that film is on there to protect your eyes mm -hmm. from that. Um, another thing is that when he's flashing that, it was it was flashing kind of a pinkish red, yes. and it is infrared. It's just past the red on the visible light into now the infrared spectrum, whereas we had violet visible light, and then just past violet, we had ultraviolet. Mm -hmm. Our eyes are only sensitive enough to pick up that Roy G. Biv, and yeah. we can pick up just on the very edge of that red, and then it transitions into infrared. We can't see it. When Stephen was showing the remote, we can't see that, but the camera um, could. It does have that some of them and then some of them again it's to protect the eyes um, from that radiation uh, something i've not tried that would be fun to try is um actually trying it through the car window oh yeah because i was i was just thinking because we actually washed cars for the first time in forever um at, at home Mm -hmm. And I was just saying, I remember seeing one of them said something about UV glass. Okay. And so I wonder if, like, if I took these and put some inside that mm -hmm. and then put some, you know, inside the other car, like, not um, with the window, yeah. if we could see a change in UV or what types of material might absorb mm -hmm. infrared. I don't know for sure. That would be a really fun investigation for that students to figure out. Yeah. If they could, because they, they have access to a phone, mm -hmm. pretty much. If they take an assumption that every household has at least one phone. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably, that's some of the things with remote instruction is they yeah. only have one phone and all the kids are using it for their homework. Right. Yeah. And so, but we know they have one uh, at most houses. And so that's kind of a... It, Close to light, uh, close to the visible spectrum, mm -hmm. parts of the infrared. They've heard of uh, microwaves. They used microwaves, right. and so that's where we talk about that. You know, yeah. where's the microwave fall on that? And so as we look at the the infrared chart, you know, where's the microwave? Is it going to be higher energy, lower energy? What's going on here? And wait, we've heard of FM and AM radios. Right. Yeah. Well, okay, they just heard of uh, XM satellite probably. <laughs> uh, but uh, AM FM radio, AM, and so FM. it's mm -hmm. and uh, I I tell you. I've, on some of my goofy days, I've brought in one of our uh, little FM radios, and oh. tuned it to whatever station beforehand. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a, I have a, 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 a um, I have a, I can detect waves oh. at certain wavelengths. Mm -hmm. I have a detector, wavelength detector, and I turn that on, and they're like, huh? You know, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. You know, we're talking about where it is and mm -hmm. stuff, but uh, I just kind of some of the goofy things to have fun to. To get the kids to think about, wait a minute, it's it is waves. Yeah, it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and so it's it, it's it's kind of fun. I, I like doing. I like having a radio there sometimes, and uh, just to talk about, you know, those waves are all around us. Mm -hmm. And then um, if your students, uh, if you could really get into this and be able to explore a little bit further, what would be interesting is let's start talking about what is four G. And we're oh, hearing more about, right. about three or yeah, 5G. five G. What mm -hmm. is that? I mean, mm -hmm. it's a lot. Well, some of these kids still grew up with like a cordless phone in the house, maybe. Right. Yeah. And so, what is that? Oh, two point four gigahertz. You know, yeah. what does that? Oh, wait a minute. That's on our electromagnetic spectrum. And so, we can even talk about Bluetooth. You know, yeah. what frequency is Bluetooth? You know, it's these so are all great. All yeah. of these are things that you can bring up to students to ask them. To get to engage them in thought about what this invisible energy mm -hmm. is, and remember, because we defined already the um, a wave mm -hmm. as a transfer of energy, energy. Mm -hmm. and so we have actual examples of that here. 
And so uh, that makes it just for a really, really fun lesson when you can get them thinking about what all is energy. Yeah. All right, for another like a lab thing students can do, mm -hmm. to actually test, and a very easy one. Um, again, I, I took this from my elementary side. Okay. And so we, we did this, I think it was second graders, mm -hmm. is one thing we used to do. You know, one thing I always told uh, teachers to do, just get um, like a t-shirt, just use a cotton t-shirt, get one that's black and one that's white, mm -hmm. to talk about the absorption of the energy from the sun, right? Now, we dug through the lab real fast, and all I found was the, what is this, felt? Felt. Felt, mm -hmm. right? So black and white felt. So we're going to see if that works. Hopefully it does. Otherwise, we'll just, you know, you'll never know because we'll delete this video and redo it with uh, shirts uh, Monday. Huh? Um, was it too honest for a video? Yeah. All right. So Sarah has an infrared thermometer. Yes. So Thank what you. is the temperature of both of them? Uh, I'm getting 20.4 degrees Celsius. Okay. And... 20.9 degrees Celsius, 20.7 degrees Celsius. Now Celsius, should we talk about our yeah. Celsius? Celsius, we, where we are right now here in Indiana, uh, in the United States, we are a Fahrenheit country. So we express our um, temperatures a lot in Fahrenheit. So 20 degrees Celsius for my students in my classroom wouldn't make a lot of sense to them because that's mm -hmm. not what they live every day. But we learned a really neat rhyme. And so I just wanted to say it for you now. You can repeat it with me. So 30 is hot. 30 is hot. 20 is nice. 20 is nice. 10 is cold. 10 is cold. Zero is ice. Zero is ice. So just a really quickly, 30 is going to be like a super hot day outside. We were outside earlier today. It's pretty hot today. It's probably yeah. edging closer to 30, I'm guessing. 30 degrees Celsius. 20 degrees is usually right around room temperature, and what that's what we're registering right now with both of these. 10 degrees is like a cooler day in the spring, a cooler day in the fall. You would probably need a jacket. And then zero degrees Celsius we know is the um, melting point of ice. I almost forgot the light. Um... All right, it's, uh, I should have turned the light on while you were doing your explanation, right on, yeah. but uh, I, I was too enthralled with your explanation, obviously. <laughs> and so, uh, just, just a clamp-on light with an incandescent bulb in there mm -hmm. to uh, generate a nice little bit of heat. Mm -hmm. And so we are basically seeing how different things reflect or absorb that light. Sure. And so, the, and, and by middle school level, we'll ask them, mm -hmm. and uh, they tend to seems like they know. I'm not sure where they learned that or when. Yeah, I But it seems like that they do know that, oh, a, a, a whiter collar is going to mm -hmm. be going. I'm going to feel cooler in a whiter collar. Yes. Whether they understand it, it's because it's reflecting more. Mm -hmm. Where the darker collar uh, makes me feel warmer because it's absorbing, absorbing more. more. Where they understand it, it's hard to tell. Um, especially because our, with the tech gears, but it wicks away. Mm -hmm. and so it kind yeah. of uh, defies what is happening right. to a degree because it's using the cooling of the sweat yes the, the cooling the evaporation there and so what are our two has this been long enough we'll see oh yes so now the white cloth is registering at 29.7 degrees celsius and the black cloth is registering at 44.4 degrees Celsius. Oh! The other thing I just wanted to point out quickly, um, this is reading to the tenths place, and that, that decimal place is just really jumping around all over the place. Um, that last decimal place that you're reading, or the very last digit, is just an estimation. So if the students are using this, I know a lot of times my students would get really concerned, like it won't just stop, it won't just, because it's constantly, that's sort of the uncertainty of a measurement, is you always need that last, in a digital device, you always need that last digit. It's never really going to stay Stand still for you and that's okay so you just you pick one and you go with it yeah okay mm -hmm. that's fair i like that uh, so it didn't take but a minute or i yeah. mean not even a minute not even a minute and uh, we got a really big difference so this could be a really quick lab mm -hmm. um, i would have our students um do this for yourself uh, and uh and see i mean don't take her word for it. She might have been lying to us. You never know. <laughs> you never know. Um, she, I don't think she was. I wasn't. It she was didn't really show it to me, though. So. Ooh. Oh, yeah. all this. It's still... I, don't, I don't trust you. Oh, and it dropped. Now it's already back down to 28 point. Oh, gosh, it keeps dropping. Well, the AC's on. I can feel it blowing my hair. It's already down to 23, 22. <laughs> 
this side of my head, bald head is cooler than this side. I think there's a vent up, up oh. there. It's, I think it's what's happening. <laughs> okay. But um, this is real quick and easy. Mm -hmm. I do a, a whole journaling thing on this. Have them journal it out. And remember, in science, if it's not in your science notebook, it didn't happen. Oh, that's good. Uh, I stole that from one of the teachers we work with. She has it posted in her uh, uh, middle school classroom. Yeah. And I love that. I absolutely love that. If it's not in your science notebook, it didn't happen. Make sure we're having them write this out. And uh, remember our evidence and claims. And so have them actually provide the evidence and make a claim and make mm -hmm. a hypothesis even. And then for them to make that claim afterwards, what supporting evidence do they have? Because this is very straightforward and easy yeah. for them to do. Oh, our evidence is the temperature. The temperature was this. Yeah. And these, um, you can get them cheap. These were really cheap ones. These were like 15 bucks, I think. Mm -hmm. These were really cheap ones. And uh, as you can see, it works fine because we're not... I don't really care what the temperature of that cloth is. Yeah. I care what about the change, yes. to be able to show change. And so I'm guessing these are fairly accurate still with the mm -hmm. technology we have today. But if it's off by a degree or two, it's not going to matter for my experiment. It's just not going to matter. Yeah. And uh, back in the Stone Ages, before we had fancy gadgets that you, <laughs> that you whippersnappers use each day, mm -hmm. um, we just we had kids. Uh, we had T-shirts, and we had kids put a thermometer in it and read uh, the thermometer. But uh, th we live in a digital world, so those analog things are slowly being replaced. I mean, it's not real world. I mean, I, I have teachers tell me, well, I want them to use a real, and understand how to really th use the thermometer. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, when and what career will they ever use that thermometer? That's true. Yeah. And so and it's to, so to me, it's let's prepare them for the real world. In the real world, it's going to be a digital thing. Now, I do ask my elementary teachers to actually show a thermometer and show them what it's doing. You shine a light on that thermometer and you see it go up. Oh, the temperature is going up. And so I want them to see that and list off those numbers for my lower elementary. But by the time I even get into fourth, fifth, I, I tell them just use the digital. Yeah. That's I realize it's my opinion. But uh, I would like to think I'm always right. Do, do we want to talk about calibrating? <laughs> how would we sure. calibrate? How, so how would we know if this temperature was reading correctly or if it was off? How would we go about calibrating a thermometer? Uh, you'd have to have a calibration thermometer. You would have to have a calibration thermometer. And so... We, sh we should make sure we put... We're going to have to watch these so we know what links to put in. Uh, the link to the globe ca yeah. cal calibration. Right. Globe, the globe.gov, they have a really good environmental lessons. Yes. And uh, one of the others is how to calibrate a, an alcohol thermometer. Yes. And so it, walk us through that. How so if we're going to calibrate a thermometer, if we had an alcohol-filled calibration thermometer, um, we know certain temperatures are always the same. And so one temperature that we know is the, um, the freezing point slash melting point of water. And so that's zero degrees Celsius. So if we have our calibration alcohol filled thermometer and we come up with an ice water bath and really you just want more ice than water in that. Um, on the Globe website though there's one pretty detailed instruction set and then one that's not as detailed but it really just all comes down to more ice than water. Um, you'll let that sit, I think it's three minutes and then, um, or maybe it's 10, actually I think you set the more ice, less water let that sit for 10 minutes, I think is what it is. Then you introduce the calibration thermometer, you let the calibration thermometer sit in that for three minutes, and then you take a reading. It should read right at zero degrees. Um, I think it can be plus or minus 0.5 degrees either way. Um, and so you wanna make sure you mark that. If it's, mm -hmm. if it's much beyond plus or minus a half of a degree Celsius, um, then I think you want to look at a different calibration thermometer. I think that's what it is. It's it's more than that, isn't it? Is it or maybe it's it one degrees. is it one and a half degrees? I thought if it was two degrees or more off you had a year in Okay, maybe yeah, maybe if it's two degrees plus or minus two degrees either way of zero degrees Celsius. But always every calibration bomber has a tag on it, like you said. Right. And it, it will uh insert picture here. Um, of a, uh, you know, I'll forget to put that in. Right. Uh, but it will show you some of ours because that's, that's a lesson we do with students. Yes. Um, we give them all one and have them calibrate a thermometer. Yeah. And so they have an actual calibration thermometer, and then all of our digital devices, they, they can run off of that. And so if a calibration thermometer is you know, right on zero or something, then they mm -hmm. know if theirs is half off, then they have to actually record that in their notes mm -hmm. that I used, you know, infrared thermometer A, which is a plus 0.5.
And so you can shine the infrared thermometer then into that ice water bath and see what reading you get. Does that work with infrared? It does. Oh, see, I didn't know mm -hmm. that. It does. And then you can compare that with your calibration thermometer. Um, but again, that calibration thermometer is just based off of that freezing point slash melting point of water, zero degrees Celsius. So. Rock on. Yeah. This is awesome.